so we're taking this time as a church to go through a series of preparations for our heart. And today we're going to be addressing a particular subject which, if we're talking about the heart, we can't really not talk about the heart and not talk about money. All right, because uh, it's a big subject uh, in the New Testament and the Old Testament, and Jesus, you know, really links the heart and money together. So we're going to be looking at charity today, okay, as our Lent series topic for this week. So it's often, you know, Christians are surprised when they find out just how much the Bible does actually talk about money. It talks about money a lot. Did you know? There are over 2,300 verses in the Bible relating to money and wealth and possessions. That's a, that's a lot. Over 2,300. 15% of Jesus' teachings and 11 out of 39 parables was on the subject of money. The subject of money was his most talked about topic. Why? Why would Jesus talk about money? so much because ultimately money is a heart issue and it's got very little to do with the weight of your wallet all right or the size of your bank account it's a heart issue and Jesus always goes to the heart of the issue and so it's right as we begin to look at the Lent series that we think about money and how it relates to the condition of our heart so that's what we're going to be doing in Matthew 6, which is sort of connected with the teaching of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he teaches on money and the heart connection. And he gives it to show us where our affections lie. Where does the affections of our heart lie? So let's have a read from Matthew 6 and verse 21. I clicked and nothing happened. So guys... You can sort that out on the, on the desk. There we go. All right. Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We're familiar with this passage, and it doesn't end here. This is actually just the first part of a chunk of teaching which Jesus does. But it's as well understood that, uh, that when Jesus was teaching this, it was well understood by the people who were hearing it. So Jesus was teaching to Jews in Palestine in the first century, and they already understood a lot about what God taught about money and possessions because they were familiar with the Old Testament. Okay, So they would have understood what Jesus was talking about. And they understood that the way you store up for yourselves treasure in heaven is by giving to the poor. They would have understood that. We don't necessarily understand that because we're in a slightly different culture here. They would have understood this. The way you store up treasure for yourself in heaven is to give to the poor. Let's have a look at what Jesus goes on to say in this passage. In verse 22 and verse 23, he says, The eye of the lamp is the body. Therefore, if your eye is sincere, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is evil, your whole body will be dark. Therefore, the light that is in you is darkness. How great is that darkness? Now that word, sincere, is literally means to be single, to be single. If your heart is single, is what Jesus is saying here. And I've got a, a, a dictionary of New Testament words that I refer to, and this is what Vine says. He says of the eye, that singleness of purpose keeps us from the snare of having a double treasure and consequently a divided heart. So Jesus is talking about a divided heart here, okay? 
Jesus gives us another word which they would have understood, which we need to unpack slightly here. And that's the evil eye. All right? If your eye is evil, all right? So I don't know quite what an evil eye looks like. You know, maybe, maybe you know, I don't know. I don't know what it looks like. But anyway, Jesus says, if your eye is evil, your whole body will be dark. What on earth is he talking about? This evil eye denotes stinginess and selfishness and jealousy. That's what they would have understood when Jesus talks about an evil eye. Again, because they were familiar. Jesus was using familiar terminology with them. So here's what he's saying. Jesus is saying in this part of this passage, what you fix your eyes on will affect your heart. I want you to remember something. Remember way back in the, when we've been reading in Genesis and Eve was being deceived by the serpent? As she began to contemplate taking the fruit, what was the thing that the Bible talks about? It says that Eve saw that the fruit was good and she became desirous of it. Her eye began to desire something which God said, don't do, don't touch, don't eat it. Okay. So her eyes, as she began to look at it and seeing that it was good to eat, started to turn her heart. And so Jesus is warning us here that, that what your eyes see affects your heart. A generous person or a person whose eyes are fixed upon Jesus and the kingdom will be generous and open-handed. Or if your eyes are fixed on Jesus, if your eyes are fixed on the kingdom of God, that's going to affect your heart because that's who you're looking at. That's who you're looking to. And consequently, the things of the kingdom and the things of Jesus will begin to grow on the inside of you because that's where you're looking. And you can't fail to be open and generous with others when Jesus is living on the inside of you. Amen? Yeah, because that's what he teaches us. But a person who has one eye on Jesus and one eye on the world will be stingy and selfish. And Jesus says their whole person will be in darkness. See, we can't have one eye on Jesus and one eye on the things of the world and desiring after those things. I mean, you know, I can't make my eyes go in two different directions. I can cross them over, but I can't make them sort of go out in, in either direction. But, but here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying your heart needs to be single. Your eye needs to be single. Because if your eyes are single and fixed on Jesus, fixed on the right things, your heart will also be fixed there. But if your eyes are evil, if you think that you can look at Jesus and then look at the things of the world and want them as much as you want Jesus, think again. Jesus is saying your heart will be divided. Jesus finishes off this section of teaching on the Sermon on the Mount by going for the jugular. If you didn't get it before, you'll get it now. Verse 24, no one is able to serve two masters, for he will either hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You are not able to serve God and money. This whole passage that Jesus has been talking about, is all about money. It's about money, heart, connection, and how that whole thing works. That there's a treasure inside of our heart. And where our heart is, our treasure will be. And about the way that we look at things and the way that we see things, what we desire with our eyes has an effect on what's in our heart. So Jesus is saying that we can't serve God in money. You can't have one eye on Jesus and one eye on wealth and riches. You can't desire both. You can't serve both God and money. So Jesus... No messing, no beating about the bush, goes and puts squarely in his crosshairs the heart of the subject. You can just see, you know, what are we going to go for? There it is. The love of money. Right between the crosshairs. 
the love of money. You are not able. That word you are not able in the New Testament is the word dunamis. It's the word for power. It's the same word that is used in Scripture for the power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. Jesus is saying, you do not have the power to serve both God and money. In other words, it's impossible. We deceive ourselves if we think we can. We don't have the power. We're not made for that. We can't. It's impossible for us to serve God and money. We can't do it. So the point of this teaching that Jesus has on the Sermon on the Mount is that it's imperative that we work at becoming single-hearted in our devotion to the Lord through training our eyes on Jesus and living his kingdom on earth. That's what he's talking about. That is what we want to be focusing on as our practice for this week. So the way that Jesus and all the biblical writers, all of them, New Testament, Old Testament, doesn't matter which way you, where you get them, Jesus and all the biblical writers saw the heart-money connection through a particular lens. And that lens is this Old Testament concept of sadaka. Sadaka. Now you've already heard this word. Richard shared it. Remember Melchizedek? That Zedek is in this word, Siddhartha, righteousness. All right? And this is the concept that Jesus and all of the biblical writers had when they thought about money, in particular as it pertains to giving charity. Siddhartha, it is a conceptual word. Okay? And the concept is righteousness and justice according to a standard. That's what it means. Okay, but it's an idea. It's an idea. It's also the word used in Hebrew for the giving of alms or charity. Okay, so when you put money in the poor box, when you're giving to charity, whatever that is, or however you do that, it is sadaka, right? Which is z, right? The, the, the tz is a z, right? So you can all say that, sadaka. Right? I know it's a bit difficult with your mask in front of your face, right? but, but it's, it's like a bead, right? Sadaka, right? So it's a standard of justice that is patterned after the character of God and his justice. That's where it's patterned from. So it's, a stand, it's according to a standard. That standard is simply the character of God. That is where it comes from. At the beginning of the Ten Commandments, all right, again, Richard shared a bit about that today, and that's where the covenant with the, with the, with the Jews was made, okay, when Moses went up and he brought the commandments down and gave the law, right? At the beginning of the Ten Commandments, God himself identifies himself like this, Exodus 20 and verse 2. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That's what God says, okay? I brought you out of slavery. I've delivered you out of slavery from Egypt. Now, the Old Testament law has great concern for Israel living rightly according to Yahweh's standards. That's God, God's standards. God's standards were standards of equity and they were standards of justice. This is what this word that we're looking at is all about. Tzedakah obligated all people to act justly and to assist those in poverty and we see that encoded throughout the Old Testament law, all the way throughout. And when I say all people, I mean all people, not just the rich. Everybody, no matter what your financial status was, you were all obligated under the Old Testament law to help those who were in poverty or to help those who were in need in whatever manner you could. All people were required to do that. So the sort of things that were encoded in the law as far as justice goes and, and bringing about this righteousness, okay, was things like farmers were... The, not supposed to uh, to harvest the corners of their field or up to the very, very edge. 
If they had an orchard or they had a vineyard or something like that, they were allowed to pick from their orchards or from their vineyards once, but they weren't allowed to go back and do it twice. Why? Why would you not do that? You'd miss out on harvesting a lot of fruit, right? If that were the case. The reason for it being is because the poor who were in the land would go to the corners of your field where you hadn't harvested, or they'd go to your vineyards where you, after you had harvested, and there would be fruit and provision for them, the poor in the land. So God wants to provide for them. So not only did he provide for the farmers and those who are landowners, but he also provided for them in the law, for those who didn't have that opportunity. So there's this idea of justice and this idea of righteousness, even in something as simple as how you harvest your field. It was there to help the poor. Every third year, okay, uh, well, in fact, every year when you harvested your field or you put in your, your, your whatever it was, your flocks or your, your, your fields, whatever you harvested or whatever happened in your flocks that year, you were to tithe. And the tithe was a tenth of whatever it was that had increased over that year. And you were to take it to the temple and it was there to feed the Levites. The Levites were those who served in the temple because they didn't have an inheritance in the land. Everybody in Israel got an inheritance. They all got land which they could cultivate, but not the Levites. The Levites had no land to cultivate. They relied upon the generosity of the people bringing in the tithe because their service was in, to the Lord. They served in the temple of God and God provided for them because they couldn't provide for themselves. Every third year that you brought the tithe in, that tithe didn't just go to the Levites, but it also went to the poor, the widows, and the orphans every third year. So that then became a, a storehouses inside of the temple were, were where they kept this extra store. And if you happen to be a person who was poor or in poverty in Israel at the time, then you could go to the temple and they would give you out of this place. So this was kind of like the first institutionalized charity okay, was actually the temple, way before the Salvation Army, right? But that's what we're talking about here. God made provision for those who were in need, who were poor. And God says, it's justice. This is righteousness, what you're doing when you give. Not the government. <laughs> well, when a member of the community fell on hard times, the extended family and the community then was obligated to give an interest-free loan to, quote unquote, sufficient for their needs. Why? So they could get back on their feet again. This was all encoded in the law. And if a person's circumstances were so dire, then they were able to sell their family lands and they were also allowed to indenture themselves into servitude. All right? They could sell themselves into slavery, but don't mistake New Old Testament or New Testament slavery for Afro-American slavery. That's an entirely different thing. It's more like indentured servitude. Okay, so I'm giving myself uh, to be employed by somebody else uh, in order to stave off poverty. So the whole of Israel, that was available for them. And then, of course, it goes on. If that wasn't good enough, every Jubilee year, which was the 50th year, all property that had been sold off so that people didn't get poor and live in poverty and all those that had sold themselves into indentured servitude were set free. They were set free. Lands were returned to them and they were set free. They were no longer slaves. They were no longer indentured into service for those people. And not only that, but the law also required that you load them up before you send them out. So it wasn't just, thanks very much and off you go. You had to load them up, load them up with money, load them up with goods, load them up with furniture and bits and pieces and clothing and all that. And you blessed them as they went out because they've been serving you. That is God's standard of righteousness. God's standard of justice. God provided for all of it. Why? So that nobody would be in poverty. 
that nobody would have lack and nobody would be in need. That is the heart of God. And that's what he tried to communicate to the Jews of Israel. So it was important that the obligation to help those in need was not just given to those who are rich, but it was in fact everybody, including the poor, those who didn't have very much, had to obey the law and do what they could to help someone else. That is God's standard of righteousness and justice. That's Old Testament. Old Testament. That's not New Testament. We're supposed to be under a, a better covenant, aren't we, Richard? Right. We've heard about some of the old covenants, and this is part of the Old Testament. We're under a new covenant. We're under a new one, a better covenant. The disciples of Jesus understood Sadaka from their Jewish culture. They already knew it. They already understood it because they all practiced it. But when they saw it through the eyes of Jesus, and when they saw the kingdom was meant to be established on earth, something even more remarkable than that happened. Something even more remarkable happened. In Acts 2 and verse 44 and 45, it says all the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions and gave to everyone who had need. I don't know if you've read that before, but that is mind-blowing especially in our culture in the West, where everything is about consumerism and about what I can get and what I can own and what I can possess. This is radical, radical, radical stuff. It was radical then, and it's still radical now. What those newly born-again, spirit-baptized believers did as they saw Jesus, what their eyes saw affected their hearts so much that they had everything in common and they sold possessions so nobody had lack. Radical. Absolutely radical. That is God's righteousness and justice in action because the Spirit led them to that. Their eyes were fixed on Jesus and the Holy Spirit empowered them to live the kingdom of Jesus into the world. That didn't happen because it was a good idea. That happened because the Spirit of God got a hold of their hearts. There was a result. It was a fruit of the Spirit of God in them. And that's why they did what they did. Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Their hearts were so in love with Jesus. Their hearts and minds were so fixed on Jesus and the kingdom of God, they freely gave not counting things to be their own. But they just gave out of the generosity that the Spirit had placed upon their hearts. Their eye was good. And so their whole body was full of the light of Christ. Did you know that giving to the poor is such a good work that is so close to God's heart that it's the only practice where God dares to obligate himself to you? It's true. Proverbs 19 and verse 17 says, Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, yeah. and he will repay him for his deed. So when you give charity, when you give to the poor, you're lending to the Lord. God will repay, because he's no man's debtor. He's not going to owe you. He'll repay you, and he'll repay you well. In Acts 10, just to kind of, again, keep it within this realms of the New Testament. In Acts 10 and verse 4, remember there was uh, the Roman centurion, Cornelius, right? A man of the Italian regiment. So the Holy Spirit first comes upon the Italians. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> all right. So he was a man of the Italian regiment. All right. So here's Cornelius. Okay. And this is what it says in Acts 10 verse 4. He was visited by an angel. Okay. And the angel answered and said, Your prayers and your gifts to the poor 
have come up as a memorial offering before the Lord. And of course, if you continue to read Acts 10, you'll find that Peter, a Jew, right, who knows about this, he comes to him and the Holy Spirit falls upon Cornelius and his whole household and they all get born again. They get wonderfully saved and they get baptized in the Holy Ghost in the same way that happened to them at Pentecost. And Peter decides, wow, if God's going to do that, then how can we refuse fellowship from these Gentile believers when they've received the same baptism that we have? How did that come about? Because his prayers and his gifts to the poor come up as a memorial offering before God. Righteousness and justice. I don't know that he knew what he was doing. Maybe he did and maybe he didn't. But God knew. And God counted every denarii that he gave to the poor. And it came up towards God as a memorial. And as such, Gentiles were included. You and me became included in the kingdom because of this man's generosity to the poor. Incredible. Incredible. God is truly no man's debtor. You cannot outgive God. God will repay. Jesus says in Luke 6, verse 38, Give, and it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For the measure which you use, it will be measured to you. Uh, how many people have been to Bulk Barn? Yeah. Bulk Barn? Yeah. <laughs> right, Bulk Barn. <laughs> okay, so you've been to Bulk Barn, right? I don't know, you know, if, if you're going to be paying by the measure, right? I don't know about you, but I'm going to be squeezing everything I can into that measuring pot because I'm going to get my value for money, right? Okay, and this is what Jesus is talking about. I said, if you use a measure, whatever your measuring cup is when you give, God is going to give that to you. And he's not just going to give it back to you, you know, all lightly fluffed up with air. All right? No, God will give it back to you, pressed down, measured, shaken, banged on the table. Make sure that all the contents settle right down so you can get that little bit of extra. And then he's going to heat more on top till it spills over. And not only that, he's going to just pour it into your lap. That is how God blesses you when you bless others. God will not be outdone when it comes to giving, especially to the poor. Why? Because it's his standard of righteousness and it's a way that he marks justice is by how we give to the poor, how we give to charity. That excites me. I don't know if it excites you. So... In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 18 to 19, Paul writes this to Timothy. Command those that are rich in this present age not to be proud and not to put their hope in the uncertainty of riches, but in God who provides us all things richly for enjoyment. To do good, to be rich in good works, that's righteousness, tzedakah, right? To be rich in good works, to be generous, sharing freely, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the future in order that they may take hold of what is truly life. Giving to the poor is good works. That is simply what it means when we read about we have been prepared to do good works. That's what it means. It means that you and I as Christians, when God prepares good works for us to do, the biblical standard for doing good works, righteousness, is to give to the poor. That doesn't mean that as we give to the poor, right, that's a ticket to heaven. No, that's not what it means. Our salvation is reliant upon Christ and Christ alone upon his righteousness, not ours. But now we're in the kingdom. We're required to do what he did. And the way that he says, you can pay me back, is by giving to the poor. That's the way that God says, you know, you can't pay me. There's nothing that you can do to add to your salvation at all. There's nothing you can do that's going to make me love you more than I do already. 
You can't add one grain, not one grain to your salvation. But if you want to show how much you love me, give to the poor. Give to the poor. And that's a consistent message throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. If our motivation for giving is to get back more than we gave, as some prosperity teachers say, not all of them, then we have completely missed the point. We have totally missed the point of what Jesus is talking about. Giving to the poor is doing righteousness and justice kingdom style. That's what it is. That's what it is. So, Say that again. <laughs> giving to the poor is doing righteousness and justice kingdom style. Amen. Amen. I like it. Sorry. All right. Okay. Amen. And I'm not going to dance at that point. <laughs> right? This is kingdom style. Righteousness and justice is giving to the poor. It's, very, it's, it's as simple as that. Yeah. It's not complicated. Okay. So, I want to pray. Right? I want to pray for us. Now, if we were doing this under normal circumstances, I might have an altar call, but I'm not going to do that now. We've got people online. We've got people in here. So I'm going to pray, and we're going to pray, and we're just going to ask God to break off some of the strongholds that we have in our hearts towards money okay, and possessions because we need our hearts to be free. Remember, this Lent series is about preparing our hearts for more of Jesus. That's the whole purpose of it. So we need to be free from the love of money. So I'm going to pray through this. And I want you, whether you're at home or whether you're here in the auditorium, rather than coming down the front, because you can't if you're at home, I want you to stand. I want you to stand so that we can pray together. Thank you, Jesus. I want you just to bring your hearts before God right now. Maybe open up your hands in an act of surrender and receiving what God has for you. I'm going to pray over you and you amen. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just repent. First of all, Lord, for having a divided heart. Father, we repent, Lord, that we have on one hand been looking at Jesus but there's a part of our heart which has also been looking to other things. And our heart's been divided. And we've been serving two masters. And Lord Jesus, we just repent of that now. We turn away from that. And Lord, we desire to have a single heart. To have a heart that is solely fixed upon Jesus and the kingdom. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we renounce the spirit of mammon. We renounce that spirit of the love of money. And we break the spirit of debt. We break all Masonic curses of poverty off of our life in the name of Jesus. And Father, we ask that you would create in us a single heart. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. And in the name of Jesus, I just release a spirit of generosity to the poor amongst us in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, so that your kingdom might be established on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So we are just scratching the surface when it comes to talking about money. As I said, it's over 2,300 verses in the Bible on this, and we certainly won't have time to go over those today. All right, we won't we won't be able to do that. this. Is simply just looking at one small area of that. Suffice to say that our goal this week is the preparation of our hearts to be single-hearted by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the righteousness and justice of His kingdom, and giving to the poor. So. This is going to be our practice this week. First thing I want you to do, okay, and this is a weekly practice, okay? There's a daily exercise as well, but we're going to begin our week by prayerfully deciding how much we're going to give. 
And we want to prayerfully decide how much we are going to give to the poor. Okay? Now remember, in the Old Testament, everybody was obligated to give. It wasn't just the rich. It was everybody. No matter what their financial status was. Remember the widow who gave two mites? Yeah. <laughs> two smallest, smallest coins that she had. And Jesus said she gave more than everybody else put together. Because that's all she had. But she knew what to do. And Jesus praised her for that. So it's not about the size of the giving. It's about the heart. Okay? This is a heart issue. It's not a money issue. It's a heart issue. So regardless of your financial status, whether you're on workers' comp, whether you're on a disability payment, whether you're on a government pension or whatever, give according to your means. All right? God doesn't want you to be in poverty. Right? He wants you to have an abundance so that you can give out of your abundance. All right? So we don't give so that we become poor because then we become a liability on other people. All right? But we give according to the means that we have. Now... How much do we give? That's between you and the Lord. Okay? I'm not going to dictate what you do, but I will say this. If you drive up to McDonald's and you get a takeaway meal, it's going to cost you 15 bucks. Well, it is when I order. <laughs> Some people might not eat as much as me. All right? But if you met somebody homeless on the street and they needed food, okay, that was their need, to feed you is going to cost 15 bucks. If you went to a restaurant, you're not going to get any change for 20. And then you'll have to tip on top of that. So consider, even if you meet somebody on the side of the road who is homeless, what do they need to be fed? Well, think about how much it costs for you to feed yourself. All right? And be generous. Be generous. But you decide between God, between you and the Lord, how much it is that you're going to give. Then number two, you're going to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to prompt you who to give to and when to give. Right? In the parameters from now until next Sunday. Right? So this is a week practice that we're doing here. Right? Don't think that I'm going to give it in a year's time. Right? It's this week. Okay? And I want to say right now, this is not a tithe. All right? I don't want you giving church money to the church. I don't want you giving money to ministries. This isn't about that. Okay? This isn't about supporting ministry. It's not about supporting the church. This is about giving to the poor. Giving to the needy, those who need. Okay? So don't give it to the church. All right? This is for the poor. This isn't to replace your regular giving and your regular tithing. Okay? This is... Giving to the poor is over and above our tithing. Now God may lead you in that prayer to bless a certain family that you may know. It may be a certain individual or you may get nobody laid on your heart to give to or how to give. Instead, the Lord might just say, put it in your pocket and I'll lead you to the person at the right time. Okay, so, so don't worry if you don't hear who to give to. Just keep it in your wallet, keep it in your purse. And be ready when prompted that the Holy Spirit will lead you to give it to the right person or the right people. Okay? Be ready. Be a watchman. Get it in your purse, get it in your wallet, put it in your car, whatever it is. Just be ready. Be ready to give when the Holy Spirit prompts you. And then for your daily devotion, right? This is to add to that. You can do it daily or you can do it in chunks throughout the week. But I want you to be reading through 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 to 13. I'm not going to read it out for you. All right? But it is about giving. Okay? Read through that. Meditate on it. Journal it. Ask the Lord about it and how it affects your heart. Okay? Meditate on that practice. And pray a personal prayer as a response to what you read. Okay? So, write that down, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 to 13. And then finally, I want you to consider an ongoing practice of keeping 10 or 20 bucks in your wallet, in your car, on your person, whatever it is. Be ready. I don't know about you, right? 
but I have gotten out of the habit of carrying cash. I've got a debit card. What do I need cash for? I've got a credit card. I don't need that, but I don't know many homeless people that have, uh, you know, an ATM machine on them, right? Or carry around one of those card swipers, all right? I don't know many. I haven't met any, actually. So what happens when I go downtown? What happens when I meet somebody in need? I'm not ready because I don't carry cash anymore. So I am going to keep some cash on my person or in my car so that when somebody comes around with that cup, right, when I'm sitting in a traffic jam, I've got something to give. And when I meet somebody who's on the side of the road who hasn't had a meal, I've got something to give. When God just prompts me, I've got something because I got out of the habit of carrying cash. And I don't want to feel that kind of guilt as I walk by somebody who's in need and I say, God, I got nothing because my shirt buttons aren't going to do them much good. So I would urge you to consider keeping at least some cash, notes preferably, because they don't weigh you down. <laughs> Keep it on your person so that you're ready. Okay? So that is our practice for this week. All right? That's what I'm